so yeah, thank you, Tara. It's it's uh, great to be here virtually, I guess, and uh, and to have a chat with my friend. And we were just having a great chat before we started about canoe making and all kinds of other things. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge. I heard great stories this morning about how to not cut off your fingers with a shingle maker and all kinds of stuff like that. But today we're going to talk about snowshoes and we got all kinds of snowshoes with us here and I know that Tara has some snowshoes there uh, in the rooms theater as well. So maybe Edwin just just to start off with let's uh, let's have a chat about going out in the woods because I know that's how kind of you got an interest in in snowshoes. Yes. Uh, first of all I'd like to say thanks for having me and giving me the opportunity to do this with you people today and uh, uh, hopefully uh, our audience there will uh, enjoy what we got to say and can bear, bear with me to get through it all. <laughs> going out in the woods, yeah. Going out in the woods was uh, something I always liked to do a lot, uh, even when I was a teenager. But when, as I grew older and I went to start to live in Whitburn and start, start having a family there, I loved going in the woods every day. Every day that I'd get a chance to go in the woods, but it was all about hunting or cutting a bit of firewood, uh, just strolling around. Uh, the hiking, uh, seeing what I can do and where I can find a nice drop of, of woods, uh, woods to cut for firewood or logs. Uh, I didn't, to be totally honest, in my early times, I didn't use snowshoes a whole lot. Uh, but uh, uh, in, in the, around in the early 90s, I got myself involved in an old sawmill uh, because my, my father-in-law was a great sawmill operator in Whitburn and my brother's uh, one of my brothers in particular, Bill Bishop in Hart Slide, he had a great sawmill. So I, I started to get interested in sawmills and I, I bought some old gear and got something going. And then I learned a few things from my father-in-law and my brother. But eventually, a couple of years into it, I bought an old sawmill uh, from uh, a cousin of mine in Hart Slide. And I started to uh, get really interested in sawing up some lumber and carts for slids and sleighs and God only knows what else. And then uh, then the uh, getting in the woods and knocking around at the logs and spending a lot of time in the woods, I kind of decided that uh, I needed some snowshoes. So uh, I started to pick out some snowshoes and uh, uh, one thing led to the other. And uh, after uh, fooling around with it a long time and finding the need for them and the need to fix them and repair them and stuff, I ended up where we are today with a whole bunch of snowshoes, but that's what was going in the woods about was, was for me, getting in there, uh, chasing my boys around and making them cut some firewood for me and pulling some logs for me. And at one particular time, we got a little horse. It's the first horse I ever had in my life. I was scared dead of him. But anyway, he was a part of going in the woods that made my life pretty happy after, after a while. It was great fun. And earlier today, we did a little test with Tara at, at the rooms, and she had a pair of snowshoes there. And you took one look at them and said, oh, those ones were probably made up on the Northern Peninsula, Raleigh way. What, what's, what's your connection to snowshoes in the Northern Peninsula? There was a, there was a man that you learned some from, uh, right? Uh, when, when I started to learn how to do snowshoes, I have, I have a nephew in Whitburn. His name is Bill. We call him Junior, Junior Bishop. And Junior was making a lot of snowshoes from, uh, from the wire, the, the small oval, oval round ones, kind of like this, this size here. I'll, I'll explain a little bit more later what, what, uh, what that's about. But uh, I started to find, find that I needed some help in repairing my snowshoes. And uh, I'd always have to end up going to, to Bill to uh, say, I was in the woods today and some women went on my snowshoe. Can you tie in a few strings for me, and 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 can you help me get to, get this going? And so I asked, where, where did you learn how to make snowshoes anyway? And he said, Well, an old fellow in Hart Slate named Nimshai Workman, because that's where I grew, that's where I was born and raised in Hart Slate. So Nimshai Workman was a fellow who was familiar to me too, because he lived not far from from my family house in uh, in Hart Slate, and he and uh, some of his brothers and other people there had married girls from uh, from down in Labrador and especially around the Northern Peninsula. Uh, I know the family that he was connected to to Mary's down there was from Raleigh area. So uh, 
he was a great snowshoe. I didn't know it at the time until I found out from Junior, but he was a great snowshoe tire. And he taught, he used to take Junior into his house, into his shed and teach him how to do, do snowshoes. By this time, I was gone away to, to work anyway, so I didn't see him tying snowshoes a whole lot. But uh, he, he showed Junior and he, he had certain ways of tying him. And he, a mar marvelous snowshoe maker. And then sometimes I'd be asking Junior and, and Junior, uh, I can't think Junior, Junior had his own little thing going. He was kind of selling a nice little snowshoes. And so the more I asked him, it seemed like the more he didn't want to show me. So I, I soon figured out after that, uh, you know, uh, he don't want me to know because he thinks he's gonna, I'm going to cut in on his business a little bit there. So anyway, that, that necessitated me to try to learn how to do it on my own, which I finally did. So what was the first the first kind of snowshoe that you made? What style did you say? Uh, the first kind of snowshoe I made was a beaver tail. Actually, uh, uh, I, I, I got a frame here, if, if I could show it. This, this particular, this particular old frame here is an actual frame from the first year snowshoes that I ever owned. And this is one of the ones that all of the string used to be busting and breaking in and I had to keep repairing. This is why I was keep going to Junior to help me fix them. And then, uh, so finally, I used this old snowshoe here to untie and tie and keep practicing by trial and error until I finally, uh, one particular time after a long struggle, I see, see you start pulling the weaves and everything got to go together because if you make one little mistake down here somewhere and you get up here, or you get over, but you actually you start right here. So anywhere you make a mistake, then you got to go back and untie all that stuff again. And you're talking probably a piece of string that's about 70 feet long. And you you know, I, I always pride myself on not having to use too many knots. But now this one got a knot. But a lot of my snowshoes had knots. But what I'd always try to do is hide my knot somewhere, somewhere in, the, in a space where you couldn't see them. Now you might ask what, what those little things here, these are, are toes and heels and, and uh, from, from practice. And what I do now, like if I let the snowshoes, I, I, it might be just my old foolish mind, I suppose, but sometimes if I lay down snowshoes for a few months or something and somebody says, hey, how about make me a pair of snowshoes? Then I get at it again and all of a sudden, especially when I get to that, the heels and the toes for a few minutes, I. She was. how did I do that? So then I got to practice, so I keep those on hand all the time, just in case I lose my mind altogether and I go back and I, I pick it up and tie it again. But I was telling, I was telling Dale one, one time before that with this particular uh, style of tying a snowshoe and learning by trial and error, and not getting as much help from Junior as I wanted to, although I, I say that in fun because he did help me a lot. Uh, one night I was uh, at Whitburn and uh, my sister used to come to visit. So Marge and my sister was up in the living room somewhere watching TV. And I went downstairs into the, into the rec room as usual, trying to learn how to tie a snowshoe. I don't know how many times I was at it and how many times I swore. But this, this particular night, I guess, this, I guess this old snowshoe and I'm pulling the string through and as I'm coming, you know, as I'm coming further up the snowshoe, I'm noticing to myself, gee, I'm not having to untie it so much tonight. And, and I'll, I could still, I could see, I'm able to look forward now as well as behind, and I could see the weave coming. And finally, I got, I got up to the last bar, I pulled the string through and everything just fell together so good. And I, I just, I, I think this was about three or four o'clock in the morning. But gee, I finally got a snowshoe made, you! And I made a great big old yell. Mar Marge and my sister come running down over the stairs. What's going on, boy? What's going on? It's three or four o'clock in the morning. I said, I just tied my final snowshoe. And the very first pair I made after that, I made a, I made a pair for my son, whose house I'm in today. And, and this here is the very first pair of official snowshoes that I ever made. And uh, they even got my old homemade harness that I made in here. So that, that was my very first absolute pair. 
I still got rolled on them somewhere. Uh, made for my son Scott in 2003. So that's that was my first real, real pair of snowshoes. And now you were saying that that particular style of snowshoe is the beaver that's tail. That's a beaver tail, yeah. right? So now I brought some snowshoes with me uh, here as well. So now this is a this is a, another style. What do you call what do you that's call a, this? That they're called. A, there, there might be a little bit more to it, but I call anything in the oval shape like that, I call them beer paws. Beer paws, yeah. yeah. And that's what most people would refer to them as. Now, most of beer paws are, are a little bit smaller, and uh, they would be kind of uh, more like this shape right here. They're a little bit smaller, but that that is a beer paw snowshoe. Yeah. Now, the other thing I wanted to just talk about is the, the ones that you're, you're showing there are using a different a different material for the for the lacing yes so you're using what are you using for your your lacing what i what i use for the lacing in most of my snowshoes is a is a dragger twine it's is a, a, a some kind of a poly poly material and a, it's a the same kind of fishman use in your dragger twines and in my opinion it's a, it's better than rawhide now a lot of people would dispute with me on that but rawhide got a tendency to soak and stretch. This stuff never seemed to stretch. And, and, and you know, you can wear those snowshoes uh, fairly often and, and they won't stretch because they don't, the, the, the string don't get wet. Now on the, uh, on the rawhide ones, like there's, there's a pair of rawhide ones that I want to talk to a little bit later, but those, those got, uh, they will stretch. And when you, when you walk on them for, uh, a good many hours out in the soft snow, they will, they will get wet and they will, the, the mesh will stretch and sod down a little bit. But uh, they still hold you up good on snow. It don't, don't make a whole lot of difference. But uh, if you put them in the heat, then they dry back up again. So now you were saying that the, the older style, the traditional ones are made with the, the, the raw hide. All, all, almost all of the old uh, traditional ones are made out of some kind of hide. Yeah. yeah. So what have you got with you, uh, today what did you bring in I terms got, of hide uh, i got the uh, when i when i i wanted to have this experience of making at least one pair with rawhide and uh, these are these are my special favorite snowshoes that i made for my son they're called an ojibwa ojibwe style they they contain my own homemade harnesses that i made myself and all of the lacing into them is local moose hide that i made myself now I want to talk to I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about that and explain it a little bit more. But a, a moose hide, you can imagine a moose hide. If you go in the woods and you kill a moose, you take the hide out of it. It's all full of skin and fat, and it's it's ugly and it's greasy and it's stinky and it's slimy and it's slippery. But anyway, if you if you mind to go through all the trouble and uh, take all the hair hair shave all the hair off and take all the fat off it, you'll end up with a very thin, tough strip of rawhide like, like this here. And uh, actually, uh, I got my next, I said to my wife the other day, I got my next project made up now for, for after the snowshoes. I'm gonna make musical instruments, you know? But, so anyway, that, that, uh, that rawhide, what you do when you want to make a snowshoe out of that, you've got to take it out, out of this frame soak it and moisten it and then you take a pair of good sharp scissors and you cut it around you, you cut it around and make make the string out of it so that that piece there is enough to make the body of one of those snowshoes that i got here and like i said fr from that this is the this is the only pair i ever made out of real rawhide because you can imagine like uh, not every day you can get your wife gone long enough to a, a moose skin in the bathtub and shave the hair and everything off, right? I always say that because that, that, that story wasn't originated by me. It was uh, some old fellow told about it. But this here is, uh, these are, I don't think, uh, uh, personally, I don't think you can buy a pair any better than those particular snowshoes. They're strong and they're tough. They got a birch frame and most of my frames are juniper. And uh, when, when I get them done then, I varnish them. Uh, the whole thing, leather, rawhide, everything is varnished. 
sometimes if I don't use vernish, I'll use a combination of linseed oil with uh, uh, with uh, stove oil or furnace oil or something like that, and that does just as good. But if you wanna you wanna preserve a, a set of snowshoes like this and keep them, I suppose for a lifetime, because I'm sure the ones that Dale got over there are pretty old. You keep a set of shoes like this varnished two or three times in the winter and keep them, don't keep them in your house in the heat, but keep them hanging some, somewhere like in your garage or a place that's dry and cool and you will have a set of snowshoes that'll last you a lifetime. Those are, I'm proud of those. They're, they're I think 52 inches long and 11 inches wide. You can put those on your feet and you can almost run over the snow. Now what I do, a lot when I'm on snowshoes out in the woods, I use ski poles to uh, to help me get along with them. And unfortunately, I can't even use them at all now because I hardly hardly walk even without them without with them. But uh, there's a picture over there on on a, on a chart that we might show you later on that I where I had them on with the uh, with the uh, ski poles. Maybe maybe this is a good time to ask a question about the, the different styles because we were having a conversation about you know that we have these three different shapes and styles of snowshoes and they each have a purpose yeah. like they each have a benefit over the other one yeah. so if we start with uh, you know we start with the bear paw ones why would you have that kind of snowshoe well, the bear the bear paw in in my opinion is uh, is probably the more most functional snowshoe of all because it's a snowshoe that's short and wide and, and they're great for working in, in small areas. Like they're, they're great for emergency use like on the back of your skidoo or quad. But if you're in the, into a drope of woods cutting firewood or logs or something where you're not moving around a lot, they're, they're short and they're such a shape that you're not tripping up in your feet all the time. And you can stamp around uh, if you want to clear down some snow where you're cutting wood, you can get out your feet and stamp stamp down around so that it makes it easier for you to put a uh, stick of wood on your back and be able to lug it along. But especially for emergencies on, like I sell snowshoes to people, or I had snow sold, sold them to people that probably never ever took them out of the back of their skidoo because they only buy them so that if they're in a situation where they get stuck and they got to get out in deep snow, at least they can get themselves out of the jam by being able to walk. Now, the other one, the the the, bear, the, the beaver tail is is a little bit different. The shape, the main body of the snowshoe is kind of the same, but this one has a, has a tail on it and it keeps you up on the snow. So if you're, if you're going looking at rabbit snares or you're traveling a little bit farther distance than you would need with the beer paws on your feet. Those will get you to where you want to go because see the way a snowshoe works, th this tail here, if you're walking right with the snowshoe, this tail here don't ever come off the snow because your, your toe is hinging in, in, in this here. Your, your toe snowshoe is coming up, your tail is dragging along, your snowshoe is coming up, your tail is dragging along. So if you're looking at rabbit snares or something, then these are these are great. I would that recommend them them for that. And those here, the the Ojibwa, if you're a person who likes to get out, like I I really love to get out on Sunday evenings when I was able to and go for a walk on my snowshoes. Those will carry you long distance over very deep, soft snow. They stay up on the snow. They, those here will keep you up on the snow almost as good of a pair, as a pair of skis. And if you've got the, uh, the poles and that to, to help you guide yourself along, you can almost run with them on your feet. It's, it's, it's just amazing. This makes it so easy to travel along. So that, that's the three basic general use. Now, I've got the other one that I have here is it's kind of a, a beaver tail with the long tail. Yeah, they're, they're beaver tail. And, and rounded at the front, but it has that nice yeah. kind of ski look to it. Yes. So they, they would be good for they, longer they'd distance. They'd be really good for traveling like those here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're, 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 they're definitely a traveling snowshoe. And but, they don't really leave the snow that no, much. No. See, see, what happened when the, uh, years ago before there was uh, uh, quads and skidoos and stuff, most of the people went in the woods to trap. 
So if they're going trapping animals and, and stuff like that, or, or going over a long snare line to catch rabbits and stuff, to, you know, the, those snowshoes had to carry you miles and miles away from home. So you had to have a good, strong pair of snowshoes because if your snowshoes breaks down and you've got money on your feet, you, you have to struggle to get home. If you're even three or four miles away in the woods. I mean, you, everybody here, even the people in the audience, I'm sure, knows what it's like, especially when we had all that big old snowstorm last year, how hard it is to get around in snow. It's almost impossible. So the, that, one, that one that Dale got there would have turned up. I, I did have one mole with a beaver tail would have turned up. I got a picture of the mole around here somewhere, but I don't have the mole anymore. But uh, it turned up on the toe that had a good beaver toe. Yeah, they're, they're really good. Those here, are, those here are gone back a little bit, but if you notice, these were turned up too, and still still turned up enough for, for getting around, for, for traveling. But they're, yeah, they're, the ones you have there is excellent snowshoes. Yeah. You're talking about the molds, and you brought a mold with you, because yes. uh, you're saying you're, you mostly use uh, juniper? Juniper is my favorite wood. Yeah, because it's nice and hard, yeah, and, right? And the reason why juniper is my favorite wood is uh, it's actually the hardest wood that Newfoundland got, as far as I can, I can understand. And it's so easy, to, when it's uh, steamed and softened, it's so easy to bend that you can do almost anything with it. Now, I got it, Dale mentioned, I brought along one of my molds. I don't know if I need to bring that back to the chair, Dale. Or... I brought along one of my moles for the for the beer paws. And on on Monday, when I knew I was coming in here, I decided I'd bring the mole along and uh, I'd put a I'd, I'd steam a frame onto it. So what I what I did, there's one pair of snowshoes on this mole, and they come off the mole, and there there is a there is one of my when I was selling, making and selling snowshoes, this would be one of my favorite molds, beer paws. Now, it will, it will go together a little bit, but what, what, did, what I got left to do now with this one here, th these edges here got to be all feathered off, and the uh, burrs got to be put across. And then what I'll do then is I'll sand them all up, I'll glue this together, sand them all up, I'll thin out the, the fronts and the, and the backs here, so th there's a lot of work left on this snowshoe yet, but the the the, the wood is uh, steamed in a in a. I used to use a steam box, but I found out la later that it's very easy to use a, a plastic bag. So I put all my pieces of wood in a plastic bag, hook it up to an old electric kettle, and what did I tell you? You got some steam box in a steam bag, I should say. But anyway, you take the you take the mold in and you. You hook, you hook the juniper in this, I usually clamp a piece of wood on here, hook the mold in here, the frame, and when the steam is good and hot, then you take it and you ply it around there, stick a screw in there, and then to take the other one stretch around on top. So in, in that mold, I make one pair of snowshoes at a time. I have had molds that I would make as many, I think probably six was the most I had. I'd make sets, six sets of frames at one time. Now, a lot of a lot of people say, "How hard is it to make a pair of snowshoes?" Well, once you learn how to tie them, it's not hard to tie them. It takes takes a nice while, but it's not hard. Except uh, sometimes when you when you leave it for a while, and you got to get the extra pieces around so to help you remember. But th those particular snowshoes here, and any good sensible pair of beaver tail or those old jibwas there. Uh, I, I timed myself on a set of uh, Ojibwas one time, and from the time I got the, the wood ready from my sawmill, put it through the steamer, trimmed it all up, sanded it all out, tied it uh, and tied all the weaving in, burnished and sanded them, and put on the harness. I had 20 hours gone. So you know, you 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 say uh, somebody will say, how much do you want for that pair of snowshoes? And you know, sometimes I'll hesitate to say uh, $65. And you know, I've had people shake my head, $65, no way. So then, you know, uh, <laughs> you're getting a bargain for $65, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Especially a pair like those moose hide ones there. I wouldn't be able to sell that. I wouldn't sell that for $500, not now. Now, you, you've also got 
some stuff there made out of a different material. And you yeah. thought you had invented something and maybe discovered you hadn't been as clever as you thought you were. You, someone else beat you to it. Yeah. But you've got, you've got some more, more modern as looking. I, uh, as I started to get a, a little bit more uh, tender from the old arthritis and stuff, and, and uh, my old sawmill started to get uh, uh, kind of like myself, a bit shabby and, and more down. I started, uh, gee, I wonder is there something else I can make snowshoes out of? So anyway, I started to experiment with some PVC pipe. And uh, this is a, this here is a set of beer piles that I made for my daughter out of PVC pipe. These are the bigger beer piles and the smaller ones. So, geez, I, I said, that's PVC pipe. That should be able to steam pretty good. So I, anyway, I put it in the, in the plastic bag and got them all ready. And uh, in, in a few minutes in the electric kettle, this is funny, in a few minutes in the electric kettle, you take out the you take out the pipe and it was it was like a piece of string. It was you couldn't hold it down the end because it would slop them all around like like a, like a shoelace. But before you got a chance to get it to the mole, it was all it was gone all hell west and crooked. And you know, like there was no way to do it. and you couldn't straighten it out anymore because there's no way to get it get it in a box to get it straightened out. So that piece is good in the garbage. So then then I came up with some ideas of Plugging the, plug the ends, put water in there. But anyway, it's all going through my mind. Gee, I can't hardly wait to get this done because I'm after inventing something here now, right? I'm going to make snowshoes out of PVC pipe. So when I finally, when I finally got my system down hand pat, I found that if I plugged the two ends of the pipe and filled them up with water, the water inside the pipe would, would boil the same thing as the, as the outside, so to keep them flexible longer. So when I got my first first ones made, I was so proud of myself. I, you know, I want to tell everybody I had a new invention made, right? So I looked at YouTube, and there was about 500 people had made all kinds of snowshoes, long, even square ones, long before I even thought about it. So, but I, 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 I like that sometimes even when I'm building a boat or something, I'll think, gee, I invented something there pretty good, but you know, somebody else already had it invented dozens of times before. But the, the moral of the story is always look at YouTube first, yeah. I guess. But uh, anyway, that's uh, PVC pipe. I believe, I believe time will tell. I don't know how long, I'd, I'd, I'd say the pipe will last a million years, but I'd say they're really good functional snowshoes. I'll tell you a story. I made a pair of jibwas out of PVC pipe. I thought I had a picture of them there. I'm not sure if I do. Anyway, I had, them, I had them hanging around the house for a while to when I got to the point where I couldn't use snowshoes anymore. So I, I got a cousin who lives out in Cornerbrook and I never seen him until, uh, he's almost as old as I am, and I never seen him until about three years ago. He came to my house visiting one day and he was talking, telling me about how he was in this rangers, the uh, search and rescue group, the rangers, and he was pretty big in that. And, and they were going off to camping in the winter and they, they had those military snowshoes and he was uh, telling me about them because he was looking at my snowshoes. So I had this uh, PVC Ojibwa there and he said, gee, I really, I'd like to have a pair of snowshoes like that. Well, I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. You can have them. He said, what do you mean have them? I said, yeah, you can have them. But I said, you got to do, do me one favor. You take the snowshoes. I'm not going to charge you anything for them. We'll take them out to your group of rangers. Let somebody use them or let everybody use them. And, and, and the, all you got to do to pay me back is let me know how you get on with them. And I think it was only sometime uh, last fall or last winter. I, I had a, a phone call from him about something else. And... I asked him about snowshoes, and he said, uh, as far as he knows, they're still knocking around that group of rangers, and they're still the best kind. So, and I mean, if them fellows can wear the PVC pipe snowshoes, I, I think they're good. Not because I made them, but because the PVC is, is good stuff. Uh, now, uh, you're also, you're a man of many talents, I must say. Pardon? You're a man of many talents. You're always making something. Yeah, I like to make stuff. 
And uh, I want you to, can you show us your artwork that you have here? Because you're also a, a great painter. You do, you do a lot of painting. There, there one time, uh, one time I announced on Facebook that I'd like to have some old snowshoes. If anybody had any old frames or any that they wanted repaired or was willing to sell, to bring them into me. So one of my nephews, he brought me in a pair of snowshoes and uh, I was sitting there one day and I said, you know what? I think I'm gonna paint something on them. Now I might not have invented this either. I don't know. But anyway, uh, my good wife helped me a lot with this too because she sews stuff. So I went to, to a, a wool store, I called it. I got some, some cotton and I got, I cut those out and got her to sew a, a little hem around. And then see, it's still only a regular snowshoe. So I took the two snowshoes that my nephew brought into me and I painted the scenes on it. This one, this one is a scene of an old trapper's cabin. Some mountains in the back, so you just hang it on your wall like that. Now when Dave came back, Dave gave me the snowshoes, but when he came back, he said, Jesus, they're really nice. I think I'd like to have one of them. So then I had to give him one back, but I didn't mind that because, now whoever made this old snowshoe here too, that's an excellent frame. And this one is made the way snowshoes should be made. It's a chopped frame. Now, with, with mine, I used to sawmill some because uh, like I had the sawmill, it was easier for me to do. But this one is actually chopped and it's uh, good. So yeah, I like to do a bit of artwork on almost anything. That's so why is the chopped better than the saw? Uh, because it, uh, if, you, if you're going to chop it, see you split, the, instead of you take a piece of birch or juniper, especially birch, it's a hard, it's a hard chop juniper, but you take a, a strip of birch and you, you with wedges and that, you split it in the middle. So when you get it split, then you're able to see the way the grain is going in the wood. But if you saw it open with a saw, you can't see where the grain is going. So if you're able to pick it out and see the way it's grown, then with your drawing knife and your ax, you can chop steadily along that grain. So it's, not, it's almost impossible then even with steam for it to break through. It's, a, it's, it's, more, it's more stronger, not so susceptible to breaking as a, a solid material. Although the, the hundreds of pair of snowshoes that I've sold, I never had a complaint from anybody. And I usually always tell people, call me or let me know. Uh, when I sell a pair of snowshoes, I don't sell very many now, but when I sell a pair of snowshoes, I always say, they're, they're not guaranteed, but if you bring them back, I'll give you your full money back, but they're not guaranteed. So <laughs> I, I sold uh, one particular winter alone. I, snow, I sold, I don't know in numbers, probably up to close to 60 pairs. I sold them in Grand Prairie, Fort McMurray, Yellowknife, uh, Two or three other places out, out, out west, Grand Prairie, River, uh, I forget the name of places now, but uh, three or four, it's a place near, it's near uh, Grand Prairie, but I just can't remember the name now. And I, I sold uh, five pairs to some lady who had a, a little uh, uh, a, a private business, like a little outback hiking hiking kind of thing i sold five pairs to her and then when when somebody had come home from yellow knife somewhere i used to put some for sale out in a little craft store there in carbonier and somebody would go in there and buy them and then they carry them off to alberta or or yellow knife or somewhere and then i'd start getting phone calls can you make me a pair of snowshoes like tom got or some of that so that way i i, I used to sell them if i had to send them away i'd sell them for 90 dollars a pair that would cover, that would cover my my postage on on a pair, right? Yeah. So I think we're we're probably getting close to the end of our time, and maybe we'll take some questions from the audience. You you told me a story about going out on snowshoes, and you got yourself into a bit oh, of a I, I, situation. I, yes, I even had wrote down here a couple of things I didn't want to forget, <laughs> and one was safety issues. Yeah, safe. Uh, you know, with snowshoes, the same as everything else, it's so it's so much fun that sometimes you got to uh, forget, uh, remember that there could be dangers involved. So I remember one Sunday evening, I was walking along with my Ojibwa's on, and you know how long and clumsy they are. 
And I came out of the woods uh, off my trail that I was always uh, used to walking on. And when I came out just before, I could see the barrens ahead of me, or a marsh, whatever you want to call it. And as I'm going out, I realized it's too late that the snow had drifted up against the edge of the woods. So when I, when I walked out a couple of more steps, I walked out over a bunch of short spruce that was covered over with deep snow. And the next thing I know, I'm down in the snow to this with my snowshoes on. And I'll tell you, it might sound funny to think about it, but it was not very funny because I had a hell of a job to get out of that hole. I'd say, I'd say it took me an hour or close to an hour or more to finally get myself out of the hole because I couldn't get that, the, the, where the spruce was so thick, I couldn't get down to get the straps off my feet. And boy, I tell you, I, 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 I almost came to the point where it was late in the evening too. I, 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 I'm going to panic. I almost felt that, that panicky feeling. Right? But anyway, I got up, I got out of, out of it, but it, it's a nice reminder if you went out on your snowshoe. Another thing I always tell people where you're going to, when you get out on your snowshoes, be careful of stuff like that. And the other issue with, is with ice. Like uh, you, you don't know how fast you can fall down on your side or your ass with a pair of snowshoes on. If you're walking out of out of a ridge, and you're coming onto a pond, and the pond looks snowy and perfect, and all of a sudden you tread onto a spot of ice with your snowshoes on, bango, you're gone for a tumble, and it could be you know you've got to be careful. It could be a very hard tumble too. A lot of the modern snowshoes. Uh, that people use now got uh, cleats on them on the bottom. That's a great idea, but uh, you know, so you, you gotta be careful, careful of stuff like that. But you know, like uh, the safety thing is kind of like I was I was thinking, I might write some short little stories on, uh, uh, I was writing some stuff down, I call it funny hurts. And when I said falling down with the snowshoes on through the woods is not funny, but you know, when you're out, it's funny. It's like, uh, it's like running down when you're a kid, running down over your, your father's fishing wire. And uh, uh, cover over the longers, they got those two or three boards running up that everybody can walk nice and straight on, right? This is, what, this is a funny hurt, right? It's funny for everybody else, but it's not funny for you. So you're running, taking off like a, a bat of the hill down over the longers, and then one of the boards cocks up. So your toe hooks up in the board, you're gone skinning your nose down on the, on the longers, you know. So everybody, all your friends are standing around laughing at you and it's, uh, it's a bit funny to him, but it's, it's hurt. Another one, that, uh, that, uh, I'm telling the ones that happened to me, another one, I know this is about snowshoes, but <laughs> I, I know uh, I, live, I live near my, my friend, I don't know if you ever heard, some of you, uh, just, he got a pretty famous name in a way, Ron Crocker. Ron Crocker used to work with, uh, I think he was regional director of CBC News in Newfoundland one time. Ron is a great storyteller too, but when we were young, we always used to get together. We'd hop, I'd hop over my fence and go up to Ron's, or Ron hop over his fence and come down to our house. <laughs> this day I stood up on Dad's fence, and just as I went to hop out over to Ron's side, the cuffs of my pants went down over the tops of the pickets. Well, you know what happened, a funny hurt. <laughs> so I got a hundred of them. <laughs> Maybe Tara, we'll we'll turn things back over to you. Are there any uh, questions from the audience about snowshoes or snowshoe making? All right. Do we have any questions from the audience for Mr. Bishop? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'm not really quite sure the process of plastic bag and steam and how he does his like does the temple go in the plastic bag mm -hmm. or and how do you not fall on your hands? <laughs> <laughs> I so, all of how this happens. Can you so the question, the yeah, so the question is about your your steaming yeah. process, the contraption you use. I can maybe show the picture yeah. if you want. Hold on. You explain it and I'll move the picture. Okay. Well, you go ahead. Yeah, okay. There's a, uh, some, sometimes I'd use a, a box. I'd make a steam box and 
making steam box that's going to hold uh, a few pieces of wood sometimes is a little bit difficult. So, you know, I came up with the idea, and I believe I invented this one, I'm not sure. I came up with the idea of using an old, old liquid kill to, uh, to steam my wood. So uh, the, the one that uh, Dale is showing you there now is a, a, a bag, like a kind of an idea of a sausage bag, and it, it's a, a, some heavy plastic that you put on the, the walls of your house if you're doing a new house over the insulation and stuff. I, the edges are taped together with uh, possibly a little bit of uh, duct tape. Uh, my favorite, favorite thing to use was uh, the tuck tape that you put on the, your house with. Sometimes I just staple it, staple it on a piece of board and uh, stick the kettle into the end of it and stick some wood that I want to steam into the bag and then uh, let the kettle boil until the wood softens up. And then you can actually bend them while they're still in the bag if you're doing certain things. Like the, the picture is showing you down there doing now where I was putting them on my boat. I actually bent that wood and clamped it on while it was still in the bag. So then you take the bag off the next day after uh, 20, 20 or 24 hours, you take the bag off and you cut around the clamps and you leave it there until it dries and the wood will never change shape no more. All you have to do is go back to your boat and screw the screws in. And uh, with snowshoes, same thing. Take out each piece of wood out of the bag, uh, putting around the mold like I showed you just now and excellent way to steam wood. I, I even put a full set of gunnels on my boat. When I made the, the boat was about 15 feet long because I built my nice few boats. And I put the bag, the whole length of the gunnel, uh, uh, clamped the gunnel onto the middle of the boat, and as the steam went in from the kettle, I kept moving clamps on different ends, and I clamped the whole thing on the boat while it was steam. And they're the hard as hell to get on without any steam, right? So that, that works really good. Do you know that old Newfoundland expression about someone who could... If you know that old Newfoundland expression about someone who could put an arse in a cat, yeah. I think it's probably Edwin Bishop. He'll, he'll find a way to do it. <laughs> I'll certainly try anyway. <laughs> Tara, you're you're muted. Sorry, I just asked if he knew if Edwin knew what the traditional method of steaming was. I'm curious because I like I like the setup, it's very ingenious, but I'm curious if you know what uh, traditionally would have been done in the province. So did you use a steam box yes, originally? I, I, I said so in the beginning I used uh, most of my snowshoes, like I I make a steam box that can probably hold six to twelve pieces of wood. Still uh, you still have to put a steam on. I have done it with a kettle, but I got one steam box that's uh, made out of a uh, a propane tank that goes on a barbecue and that one can generate steam for three or four hours at a time and there's a uh, yeah this is I, I use a lot of uh, so I what would people use in the pardon? in the days before kettles and propane what what did people well, use how did they like, uh, when one of the first boats i ever built and one of the boats i helped my my father build we used to just sometimes stick a pipe down in the ground on a, on a 45 degree angle, fill it up with uh, water and uh, build a fire around it. And uh, when, the, when they, they were hot enough, you take them out and bend them around. I had one of my brothers used to have a, uh, an old fashioned hot water boiler put up on some cinder box. And he had the top cut out of that and he'd build a big fire around and he'd actually boil them off. And that, that's how he built his boats, right? So. Yeah, I've, I've used, uh, I've had pieces of pipe with legs on it. I could, I could bring in a museum myself with the uh, steam boxes and stuff that I got left around out there now. Yeah. And any other questions from the audience here? Another thing too that uh, a lot of, another thing a lot of people did in the original days with, I got a book there I was showing Dale earlier about snowshoes that was written is a is a, a Newfoundland craft book. This section there was done by a fellow George Allen from down Hot Bay somewhere, and he said a lot of the old fellows in the lumber woods when when they used to build or repair their 
snowshoes, they used to put a kettle of hot water on the stove and fill it up with rags and they'd just keep rubbing the rubbing the rags on the on the wood and they'd they'd start the frame on the mole and they'd keep rubbing and wringing out the rags on the moles until it got soft enough. See steam actually makes the wood stretch, right? And when you stretch it and leave it in that position for until it dries, it won't go back to normal. It'll stay. Sometimes I'm building a boat or something, I'd 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 do a little bit of overbending. So if it did go back a little bit, there was no problem, right? And any other audience questions for Evan? Doesn't look like we have any more, but I'm sure you got a story or two more that you might want to share. Uh, <laughs> one thing I I I know you you Edwin made this great display. I'm gonna I'm gonna move my camera over. One of the questions I had was, you know, we were talking about the moose hide, right, Edwin? And and I was saying, how do you get a 70 foot long piece of moose hide? So you you made a little demonstration here. You just, you just want to explain how you connect I stuff. Come over there. No, no, you can keep talking. See, like uh, what I did with that little demonstration there, when when I when I was telling Dale, Dale did a recording with me on on uh, snowshoes before, and he said, "How do you manage to haul a seventy foot piece of string? Believe it or not, if you want to build your snowshoe in one piece, you got every time you tie a knot, you've got to pull that seventy foot of string right through the knot." I'll, I'll tell you a funny story if I got time after about that too. So anyway, what I did on the chart over there. I put a couple of pieces of string in there. The first two pieces of string on the on the left, where Dale got his hand now, are just two pieces showing the type of uh, string that I use, and the green one goes with that too. And then the next next two are showing ways that I join my string. Like if if I didn't want to use a seventy foot piece, usually usually uh, when it's a bit quicker, I'll do it in two pieces. You can you can burn burn the two ends with with a lighter and you can squeeze them together and make the a joint with. It. Now I do, I don't do that a lot if I'm making snowshoes for somebody else because I'm afraid it would give out. The other one is uh, I tie two knots and uh, I push one knot through the other and I pull them pull them through tight. That knot will never give out. You 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 wear you wear out snowshoes before you wear out that knot. Now the hide is a little bit different because pretty hard to find a piece of rawhide that's any longer than 20 or 30 feet. So what I do with the rawhide, I take each end and I cut a little slit in it and I, I push the, the ends through like almost like threading the needle. And then if you pull the two ends together, I don't know if Dale can show it close up or if you can see it close up, then, uh, then especially when they, yeah, right, you can see where the two ends go, to, go together, right? And the other one is just a little strip I put in to show the, the moose side that I use for my own own snowshoes. But anyway, uh, I was making a snowshoe. I got this friend. He, he does everything for me in the world that I, that I, even if I don't ask him, he's, he's one of the best friends I've ever had. So when I was learning how to make snowshoes, I wasn't too good at it yet, but, but, I, but I was getting there, right? So I was sitting in the living room one night at about seven o'clock after supper. And then walks my friend, Max, and his, and his son. And Max said, what are you doing now? I said, I'm tying snowshoes. So he's sitting there watching me for a minute, right? So anyway, he, he must be getting fresh, frustrated. I'm tying knots, and when I pull the loop through, I'm hauling on this son. They're sitting there, and I'm hauling this string, almost like hauling up a fish on the straw line, right? So Max said, geez, he said, that's an awful slow way to do that. He said, it must be a better way to do that. And he said, here, let me take the end. So he, Max takes the end. Now, Dale has been in my house. He knows what it's like. From my living room, there's a hall that goes down to a little, little what I call my computer room. It's like a little rec room, I suppose. Out on the back of that, I got a, a I had an, a grade that's finally attached to the house that I, I use it now for my, my art shop. So the, the whole total distance down down to the end of the house is probably 40 feet, right? So when I pull the end of the string through, Max takes the string by the end and he walks all down to my art shop, right? 
And she said, okay, start hauling the string. So I'm trying to haul the string as Max said. And I said, geez, Max, this is not going to work for you. I said, how am I going to haul you through the knot when I get you up to the snow queue? <laughs> that was a great laugh that day. <laughs> Little did he realize, you know, you can't, that, that string, when I pull it through, I let it fall on the floor in a certain way, right? So anyway, that snowshoe never got finished that night. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'll turn on the lights again. I don't, I don't think that we have any more uh, audience questions, but uh, a big thank you to Edwin. And, uh, there, and was to a, <laughs> there, there was a lady that, uh, that sent me a question on Facebook. Uh, I won't say the name because I don't think I should, but uh, if there's a lady in the audience that told oh. that she sent me a Facebook message a couple of days ago and said that she had a, a pair of snowshoes that she believed came from Labrador and asked her if I had any idea of how she might do, what she might do with them to reserve them without, to preserve them without doing any damage. So if she's in the audience today, tell her, send me a picture of her snowshoes and I'll certainly do whatever I can to, to help her out, see if we can do something for her. There you go. Thank you all very much for joining us today and a very special thank you to Edwin for all his knowledge and storytelling and his, his just, he's a, he's a folklorist's dream. We're, I'm gonna, I said we're going to have a long chat about sawmills now at some point. And we'll be back maybe. We'll set, up a, we'll set up a sawmill on the front yard of the rooms and saw some logs. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I certainly like to Thank you for the opportunity. I, I know I'd be, I, I'm a little bit sorry that I couldn't come to the rooms, but uh, with, with my help in the COVID, I was a little bit, uh, little bit nervous about that stuff. And now, uh, to be totally honest with you, if I was there sitting down with you live, I'd be a lot more nervous than what I am today too. <laughs> but, you know, that don't count in the long run, I suppose, as long as you can do it one way or the other. But I certainly enjoyed the opportunity and uh, everybody who came there to, to see me do it, uh, thank you all. And thank Dale and uh, and uh, uh, Tara. <laughs>